Take a close look at the eye in this picture. Why does it look like that? Is it a bionic eye? What are those lines? Almost 185,000 people a year have eyes that look like this, at least temporarily. And although it may be a scary thought, as it turns out, your eyes may look like this one day, and I'll tell you why. But first, let's take a look at how this all starts. Amazing. There are many ways you can develop eye problems, especially as you age. For instance, you may get glaucoma, which damages the optic nerve connecting the eye to the brain due to a buildup of pressure in the eyes and may lead to blindness, especially if it goes untreated. Another common eye condition is cataracts, which occurs when the eye's lens, which sits behind the iris and pupil, becomes clouded. However, these eye conditions don't lead you to having eyes that look like this image. What will lead you to eyes like that, though, are eye conditions which damage the cornea, which is the clear layer on the front of your eyeball. Some unfortunate people are prone to what's known as corneal opacities, which are conditions that lead to the cornea becoming cloudy or scarred over. Since light passes through the cornea before reaching the retina in the back of the eye, if your cornea is cloudy, your vision blurs to the point that you may even become blind. If you ever suffer from one of these conditions, you'll get symptoms that include glare, which presents problems in dim or bright light, and blurred vision, especially in the morning. You may even experience pain or grittiness in your eyes as a result of tiny blisters that form. As it develops, your vision will distort even more, making it difficult for you to see at night and you may become sensitive to light or see halos around light. If you experience any of these, make sure you go to see an eye doctor. So, why do some people's cornea blur? For a number of reasons. Sometimes it may be due to a bacterial infection called trachoma, which isn't all that bad since it can be easily treated with antibiotics. However, some conditions aren't as easy to treat, like Fuchs' dystrophy, which occurs at the cornea swells. Fuchs' dystrophy is often inherited, and having a relative with the disorder increases a person's risk of developing it. Women are slightly more likely to be affected than men, and most people don't develop symptoms until their 50s or 60s, although the disease might actually start decades earlier. Once the cornea is permanently damaged, whether by Fuchs' dystrophy or another disorder, the best treatment for some patients is a corneal transplant. In this surgery, a damaged cornea is replaced with a healthy one from a donor. The donor cornea comes from the recently deceased person who is screened for diseases that might affect the outcome of the surgery. Surprisingly, this surgery was first performed in 1903 by Edward Zerm. In fact, it was the first human transplant ever performed successfully. Then, in 1955, a clinical teacher for the Welsh National School of Medicine came up with the idea of a donor system and eye bank to help doctors find corneas for transplant. In the early days, corneal transplants were performed with rudimentary tools. Fortunately, sutures made it easier to secure the new cornea in place, and today, lasers have mostly replaced scalpels and other blades for the surgery. Although replacing diseased corneas with healthy new ones can restore sight in many countries, there's a shortage of corneas available for transplant. The eye needs to be harvested within a few hours of the donor's death, and depending on the storage method, it may only last three or four weeks before it has to be transplanted. Another problem limiting the supply of corneas is that many people choose not to be donors. In some countries, cornea donors are especially rare. For example, Muslim countries have low rates of overall organ donation because Islam forbids followers from damaging their body before or after death. Even when there aren't religious concerns, people often feel just plain uncomfortable about eye donations. Lots of people see their eyes as a very personal body part. They're how we make a connection to each other. Some people simply feel their eyes are more personal than, say, a kidney and are more reluctant to donate them. Fortunately, there are some people who feel differently, especially in Sri Lanka. The majority of citizens are Buddhist and believe in a cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Many believe that donating their corneas is a way to improve their karma for their next life while helping others. Some also think that by donating their vision, they will see better in their next life. Buddhist monks help by pointing out that cornea donation can be considered dana, or an act of giving that may help them reincarnate into a better life and the stats prove their willingness to donate, as one in five Sri Lankans have signed paperwork to donate their eyes when they pass.
There are so many eager donors in Sri Lanka. The country has been harvesting more corneas than it can use for many years, and often exports them to other countries in need. In 1961, a Sri Lankan doctor named Hudson Silva started the Eye Donation Society, and in 1964, he opened its first eye bank. Silva's eye bank has grown, and in 2014, the society exported more than 2,500 corneas. Today, Patients and doctors consider many factors before deciding on a corneal transplant. Patients should decide if their vision problems are significantly impacting their work or other aspects of their life, and whether other, less invasive options might work, such as special contact lenses. Cost is also an issue in many countries, like the United States. Insurance may not cover all of the associated expenses of surgery. Recipients also need to take time off for work for recovery, sometimes for six months to a year. Before surgery, recipients and donors are screened. Previously, recipients older than 65 were rejected due to age alone. However, the cornea donor study found most corneas from donors between the ages of 34 and 71 remain healthy in recipients more than 10 years later. In the U.S., about 75% of donors fall in this age range, and about a third of donated corneas come from a donor aged 65 to 71. Once the surgeon is ready to proceed, the patient is given an anesthetic. Sometimes general anesthesia is used, which puts patients to sleep. But often patients are given a local anesthetic, meaning they're awake for the procedure. An injection relaxes the muscles around the eye, suppressing blinking and eye movements. Numbing drops are also given to anesthetize the eyeball. After the area is numb, surgeons use a lid speculum to prop the eyelid open. In a traditional corneal transplant, the doctor then removes a round button-shaped full thickness section of the diseased cornea. Some surgeons still use a sharp instrument called a trephine for this process. But today the trend is to use a femtosecond laser instead. A matching button from the donor cornea is then placed in the hole left behind. It is situated carefully, then the doctor sutures it into the eye. The stitches seen in this image will stay in for anywhere from 3 to 17 months after the operation, depending on the rate of healing. They can also be adjusted to help reduce astigmatism caused by an uneven eye surface. In an alternative surgery called an endothelial keratoplasty, the surgeon removes and replaces only the innermost part of the cornea, the endothelium, and leaves the healthy upper part intact. The thin layer of donor cornea is placed on the backside of the patient's cornea, and held in place using an air bubble. This process usually doesn't require stitches. After either procedure, a plastic disc is fitted over the eye to protect it during the healing process. Although patients aren't usually groggy from anesthesia, they will still need someone to drive them home. Cornea recipients need to be careful after surgery, avoiding heavy lifting and exercise for several weeks. Their vision will be blurry for a while, and it can take up to a year for them to fully heal. Because there's no blood supply to the cornea, the risk of rejection is low. In fact, cornea grafts are among the most successful of all the tissue types that are transplanted. However, the body can still recognize the cornea as foreign and trigger an inflammatory response. And because glaucoma and corneal swelling from previous surgeries can increase the odds of rejection, recipients are often prescribed steroids and other medications to reduce pain and swelling. Patients are told to watch out for the early signs of rejection with the acronym RSVP. No, that's not an invitation to a fancy dinner. It stands for redness, sensitivity to light, vision decreases, and pain. Rejection can usually be reversed with medication if caught early enough, so patients are urged to contact their doctor at once if they notice any of these signs. Patients also need to keep their eye covered to reduce the risk of injury to their new corneas. Infection is another possible adverse outcome, and doctors usually monitor patients carefully for signs of infection. Eyesight can fluctuate for months after a transplant, as the new cornea settles in. Patients are often left with some degree of myopia, or nearsightedness, because the curve of a new cornea usually doesn't exactly match the curve of the old cornea. Most of these problems can be corrected with glasses or contact lenses. If not, it's possible to have LASIK corrective surgery to further improve vision once the transplant has healed. I'm not sure about you, but our medical ingenuity continues to amaze me. Did you learn something new? Or do you know of any other medical conditions that may make for an interesting video? If so, make sure to let me know in the comments section down below. Thanks for watching.